Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello, Florence Nightingale had said, physician do no harm and that is precisely what I am going to be talking about when physicians do no harm to their patients. So today's lecture is on preventing hospital acquired infections by universal safety precautions and care bundles. What are the various sources of hospital acquired infections? You have endo endogenous or self infection that is common cell organisms when they are transferred to another site in the body become pathogenic. Examples of these are E. coli, Klebsiella pneumoniae and Candida species and then we have exogenous or cross infection organisms transmitted from another source. These organisms may be transmitted by healthcare workers, other patients or even from the environment. What are the modes of transmission of hospital acquired infections? They are divided basically into three groups, contact transmission which may be direct or indirect inhalation which is dro droplet inhalation or airborne inhalation and finally common vehicle. In direct transmission, direct contact transmission, it is usually via the hands which have not been washed properly or by not following aseptic precautions during instrumentation. In the indirect methods, it is through gloves, instruments like stethoscopes, contaminated needles or after touching inanimate objects. Inhalation is generally generated by coughing or sneezing or the presence of the organisms in the air. Now droplet, droplet inhalation usually deals with organisms which are more than 2 micrometer in size and travel for shorter distances, usually less than 3 feet. Airborne infections are those which are less than 5 micron in size and these tend to go further up and remain suspended for a longer period of time. Common vehicle transmission is through food or water. So let us look at the common infection control principles and practices. We start with standard precautions and then we move on to other precautions. In standard precautions, we will be dealing with hand hygiene and personal protective equipment. Now these standard precautions were also earlier referred to as universal safety precautions and these are designed to reduce the risk of transmission of microorganisms from either recognized or unrecognized sources of infection. These precautions apply to blood, to all body fluids, secretions and excretions except sweat with or without visible blood present on them. They are also applied for non-intact skin and for mucous membrane. So I have already mentioned the standard precautions were earlier called universal safety precautions and to emphasize again I would like to tell you that these involve hand, hy 
hygiene and wearing of appropriate personal protective equipment. So, what are the five moments of hand hygiene? There are, this is before touching a patient, before clean and aseptic precautions, after body fluid or exposure risk, after touching a patient and after touching patient surroundings. This is a blood agar plate on which impressions of the hands of the fingertips have been taken. Now, A represents the part where without any procedure. B is after washing hands with soap and water. And C is after disinfection with alcohol. So, as you can see, A shows the maximum number of colonies. Washing hands with soap and water, if not done properly, will also show you presence of col colonies. And after disinfection with alcohol, usually you do not see any colonies. For, so, which brings me to how proper hand disinfection should be done. So, when you have to do hand disinfection, you would wash your hands with soap and water. You start with opening the tap and putting your hands under the water, running water. Then you take some soap on your hand, rub the palms together. The next step involves going down till the wrists. After this, you would involve the part between the fingers, the interdigital spaces. You do it posteriorly and then you do it anteriorly. After that, you have to clean your fingernails and this can be done by interlocking your hands. Following this, you would rub the thumbs of both the hands individually. And finally, you would clean the center of your hand. After doing this, you will again wash your hands under flowing water and you would close the tap with the elbow. Remember, all rings should be removed. And these are the spots which can be missed when you are washing the hands. The red part represents those which are most frequently missed. Blue or gray is less frequently missed. And the yellow part is usually not missed. Standard precautions involve using personal protective equipment. Masks and shields should be worn whenever you expect a splash. Protective glasses can also be worn when you are expecting a splash. Gowns should be also worn when you are coming in contact with a patient who is infectious and gloves should be worn whenever you are going to come in contact with blood or body fluids. We move on to transmission based precautions. These are done when you know that a patient has an inf infection or you suspect that the patient ha is harboring an infectious agent. You initiate these when the illness is first suspected and discontinue when the illness has been treated or ruled out or the room has been cleaned thoroughly. Uh, whenever you are suspecting an infection in a patient, you should ideally, ideally put him in an isolation room. If you do not have facilities for isolation, you should put him at the corner of a ward. And if there are more than one patient with the same kind of infection, you should 
cohort those patients. That is, you should put all those patients at one site. Transmission borne pre precautions would include airborne precautions where you want to interrupt infection spread by small particles in the air such as chicken pox, droplet precautions where you want to prevent the spread of large, large droplets by coughing, talking or sneezing such as influenza and contact precautions where you want to prevent skin to skin spread. Flagging for isolation or cohorting can also be done, especially when there is no isolation room. Posters can be put up to highlight the type of precaution which needs to be taken. In contract transmission, where you want to prevent transmission of microorganisms by direct physical contact or by indirect physical contact, you must wear gowns and gloves which should be discarded in the room where the person patient has been isolated or next to the bed wherever the patient has been cohorted. And these are usually done for multidrug resistant organisms like carbapenemase resistant enterobacteriaceae or methicillin resistant staph aureus. To enhance droplet precautions, these should be initiated when there is international, regional or local health alert of an epidemiologically significant respiratory pathogen. Here, the precaution includes using an N95 mask, gowns, gloves and eye protection. And these are done whenever you are expecting organism like the SARS or the pandemic influenza strains or other pathogens which are not yet identified. Airborne precautions require single room with negative pressure airflow. Now this kind of a precaution is usually taken in places where do they do not expect infections with tuberculosis or chicken pox or disseminated zoster or measles. In a country like ours, we can't afford to have negative pressure airflow and therefore we can just put these patients in isolate, isolation rooms. The next infection control practice is to prevent needle stick and sharps injury. Preventing needle stick injuries. If you want to make sure that you do not get a needle prick, you should always be sure that you never recap a needle. You should never bend or break a needle. Do not pass a syringe with a needle to another person by hand. Always place it in a tray when you are passing it. Do not distract staff who are handling a syringe with a needle. After the procedure is complete, you should discard the needle in puncture proof containers or destroy them with a needle cutter. In case a person has had a needle stick injury, then he should encourage the wound to bleed, flush it with water, wash with soap and water or apply an antiseptic and then notify your supervisor and immediately seek medical attention. If necessary, take post-exposure prophylaxis if the patient is either HIV positive or HBSAG positive. If you receive a splash on the face or any other part of the unprotected skin, flush well at the nearest sink or eye wash fountain and notify your supervisor and seek appropriate medical 
advice. Coming to cleaning and disinfection, preventing spread from the environment is very important. As you can see in this picture, all the places which have been marked with red are potential sources of infection and therefore they have to be disinfected. These spaces, the frequently touched surfaces, bed rails, bedside commodes, bathroom fixtures, doorknobs should be frequently disinfected as should equipment in the immediate vicinity of the patient. Whichever germicide has been used should be kept for an appropriate contact time, usually 10, mi 10 minutes. Ensure that germicides are constantly rotated. Mop heads and cleaning cloth cloths should be washed after utilization and the mops should be kept for drying before reusing. Have written cleaning protocols and checklists to ensure that these are being followed meticulously. We now move on to care bundles. Now care bundles are usually utilized in areas where some kind of intervention has been done in patients. They are usually a collection of 3 to 5 interventions which have been described after obtaining evidence to show that these have prevented hospital acquired infections. They should be applied consistently for all patients at all times to have improved outcomes. Now these interventions are usually in patients who are admitted in the intensive care units or are immunocompromised for some reason or the other. Uh, to illustrate this, I would like to share with you uh, the history of Raju, a 30 year old laborer who was brought to a hospital by his patient, by his relatives. He was brought to the hospital after a fall from a height. On examination, the doctor found that he had traumatic paraplegia and urinary incontinence. The sister in charge was asked to do a urinary catheterization. Supportive therapy was started. Three days later, Raju Jiva developed chills and fever. A urine sample which was collected through the port with full aseptic precautions was sent to the laboratory for culture and culture revealed E. coli with a colony count of 10 raised to 3 colony forming units per milliliter of urine. Raju appears to have contracted a hospital acquired catheter associated urinary tract infection. For one, the only intervention which was done in him was the insertion of the catheter. Second thing is that this infection developed 48 hours after the intervention. Now which are the sites he could have got infected from? One could be the urethral meatus and around the catheter. These kind of infections usually occur if the person who while performing the catheterization has a not used sterile catheter, not used a proper, you know every place should have a sterile 
urinary catheter tray, which should have all the material which is required for catheterization to be kept in it. The second thing that could have happened is that the person who was inserting the catheter may not have done a proper hand hygiene. The next thing is that the infection could have occurred for a junction between the catheter and connecting tube. Now this usually happens if the closed system is disturbed at any time. The other place that it could have occurred was connection from the drainage bag and reflux from the bag to tubing. Now for this it could have happened that when Raju was taken for his MRI, very often the attendant who takes the patient is not cautious about keeping the urine bag below the waist level. Invariably, you will find that when a patient is being transported, the urine bag has been kept next to him on the trolley. So, this is one place where one has to be very careful. So, the, these are the three important sites where infection can occur in a catheterized patient. So, what could have been done to prevent the infection in Raju? You could have applied the care bundles for preventing corti. And these are the catheter should be inserted only when there is an appropriate indication, which in Raju's case was appropriate. Only sterile items should be used for insertion and hand hygiene should be followed. The catheter should be inserted by non-touch technique with strict asepsis. There should be a closed, closed drainage system and the catheter should be properly secured after placement. We also have a maintenance bundle to prevent corti. That is, you need to review daily for catheter, whether the catheter still needs to be inserted. The drainage bag should be placed below the waist and above the floor it should not be resting on the floor. It should always be emptied when it is three-fourth full using a clean container for each patient separately. Separately, Urine samples should be sampled only from the sampling pot and if necessary, if the sampling pot is not there, then you must ensure that you have cleaned properly with spirit before collecting. Hand hygiene, proper protective equipment should be worn before and after catheter care. Now we move on to care bundles to prevent central line bloodstream infections, also referred to as CLAPSI. And these are the various potential routes of infection. Now with these in mind, evidence has shown that these are the precautions that we need to take. One is hand hygiene pre-insertion, full sterile barrier precautions for operator and patient in the form of the operator wearing cap, mask, gown and gloves and the patient should be covered with a sterile sheet from head to toe and only the site where insertion has to be done should be kept open. A appropriate skin disinfectant should be used. You should avoid using the femoral site and you should always cover the site after the insertion with a translucent dressing. Maintenance blunt bundles to prevent clapsy are daily aseptic central line care during handling which includes hand hygiene, hub decontam decontamination by alcohol before introducing anything 
through the three way daily documentation of local signs of infection change of dressing daily review for removal of line and if there are signs of infection the line should be removed and the catheter tip sent for culture care bundle to prevent ventilator associated pneumonia includes elevation of the head of the bed for 30 at 30 to 45 degrees daily oral care peptic ulcer disease prophylaxis deep vein thrombosis prophylaxis if not contraindicated daily sedative interruption and daily assessment for readiness to extubate so the idea in all these interventions is to ensure that we try and remove these as soon as possible i move on to the last part of the care bundles that is care bundles for surgical site infection prevention we start with the who surgical safety checklist this should be used pre operatively before any operation is started in addition the patient before he comes to the ot should have been bathed hair removal should not be done though in cases when necessary hair can be cut short intra operative anti mike prophylaxis should be given at the time of incision or just half an hour before incision surgical hand hygiene should be done the appropriate sterile personal protective equipment should be worn maintenance of oxygenation temperature and blood glucose should be appropriate and post operative wound dressings should be done at the appropriate time so this brings me to the end of this lecture where i have told you about how to prevent hospital acquired infections the standard precautions which you would use the transmission based precautions which you should use prevention of needle stick injuries and cleaning and disinfection and the more specific care bundles which are used to prevent corti clapsi wap and ssi thank you